Revelation, Revelation chapter 1, the last book of the Bible, uh, last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 1. And what we've just sung uh, is verses, <laughs> where are we, 12 to 16. We've just sung a paraphrase of those verses and James is now going to come and read 17 onwards. Thank you, James. We're going to read uh, Revelation chapter 1 from verse 17 uh, through to chapter 2, verse 7. And this comes from part of a revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ that the Apostle John saw. John writes, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, for behold... Uh, <clears throat> I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Right, Revelation, Revelation chapter 2. We're doing a series in Revelation, just in case you're not aware. Um, we began it last year. Uh, on the way through, we missed out chapters 2 and 3. They are unique in the book. They are letters to seven churches. Um, and carrying on with chapter 4, last year we reached chapter 6, so chapter 7, if you're still with me, chapter 7 is Sam's domain this evening. Okay, and for the next seven weeks in the morning, we're going to look at these seven letters in chapters 2 and 3. Hope that makes sense. You can listen to previous uh, sermons um, on, on the website if you still want to catch up with what you may have missed. Um, now, the seven letters are to seven churches in what is now Western Turkey. And John on the Isle of Patmos, uh, just out into the, the sea there, off the coast of Western Turkey, uh, if he could take his telescope, he might just see Ephesus in the distance. And that's the first church. And then in a, um, I think it's a, anti-clockwise direction, more or less. If you look at the, a map of those seven churches, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea, you'll see them going round in a sort of anti-clockwise circle from Ephesus, which is the nearest one. Clockwise, thank you, Mark. OK. <laughs> um, there was going to be a map, but some of my technology failed and we didn't get it in, in time. Um, it's, it's fairly simple. Western Turkey, some of the cities are still there, I think some have gone. Um, 
There we are. So we've got these seven letters. These seven letters. Now, um, these letters are what the Lord Jesus in chapter 1, verse 11, told John to write about. Write what you see in a book sent to the seven churches, and there they're mentioned there, Ephesus, Smyrna, there they all are again. Um, so there was the writing, and the writing is repeated at the, each, at the first verse of each of the seven letters. So chapter 2, verse 1, uh, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. But then at the end of each of the letters, it says, he who has an ear, or something similar, let him hear. What is he to hear? What the Spirit says to the churches. So, the book of Revelation that we have in our hands, what a privilege to hold it still, 2,000 years later, in our hands. Uh, the message to the angel of each church wasn't just for the angel. It was for all who have ears to hear. Now, the description of the Lord Jesus in chapter 2, verse 1, and there's a different description at the head of each letter, is the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. So that refers back, obviously, to chapter 1. Um, and verses 12 and 16 refer to the lampstands. We've just sung that one, haven't we? And 16 to the stars. And then the Lord Jesus himself, in verse 20 of chapter 1, explains what those two symbols mean. So, uh, the stars in my right hand we read. Um, the stars are the angels of the seven churches. And if you go back to the website and listen to Pete Skur preaching on the 1st of November last year, you'll hear that he understands that to be the pastors of each church. There may be slightly different opinions on that, but that's, that's good enough as a working a working piece of knowledge for us this morning. It's the authority that God has given to be within each local church. And the lampstands are the seven churches. So to whom does this apply? So does this letter to Ephesus apply only to Ephesus? No, because in verse 7, again, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So although it was focused particularly in the content of the letters to each church, that content is relevant to all who have ears to hear. And that is all of us this morning as well. The central part of this letter to Ephesus is in verses 4 and 5. And verse 4 may be something you've heard quoted or spoken in the past about um, leaving your first love. And that's where we're going to focus our thinking on, on that verse 4. And we're going to link the other verses to it. And the first of well, three sections this morning, uh, we're going to look at that, what abandoning one's first love does not mean. So a bit of a long title, isn't it, for a section. Abandoning the love they had at first doesn't mean the lack of, verse 2a. What doesn't it mean? So you, a church can lose its first love, which means its love to its Lord and Saviour. 
And yet it doesn't mean that that church lacks all the things listed in verses 2 and 3. And they are considerable. So a church, and this is sobering, isn't it? A church can lose its first love, can abandon, can desert its first love, its saviour, and its love to his saviour, to the saviour, but still have much labour and toil. Verse 2a. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. They worked hard as a church. That's what this means. They were keen to work for the good of the church. What that meant precisely, we're not told. But as examples, think of what, what we do, what any of us do with it within the church and beyond it and for it. And much of that is toil, isn't it? It's labour. It demands commitment. They worked hard as a church there in Ephesus, across the water from where John was receiving this letter um, from the Lord. They also had patient endurance in that labour. They worked hard and they kept at it. They kept on. They persevered, as we heard last week in a different context. And love is that which perseveres. Love endures. But they were persevering, but they'd lost the love. They were perhaps speaking uh, amongst their neighbours. They were going and doing this work, this toil, in their local church in Ephesus, um, against opposition, maybe. But they persevered. They carried on, on and on. They also had some discernment of what was right doctrine and what was wrong doctrine. Hence, they were able to uh, look in verse 3. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up. No, it's verse 2, isn't it? Um, you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. There was some theological, shall we say, theological perception and sensitivity about what was right, in other words, what was according, in, in our terms, to this word, the Bible, which they wouldn't have had uh, complete at that point, and what was not according to that, that word. And there were some people, obviously, in Ephesus who claimed to be apostles, they have tested them, they found them not, and, uh, and they found them to be false. So presumably they excommunicated them or whatever they did, uh, but they found them, they, they discerned them, they distinguished between the truth and falsehood in this matter. They also, verse 6, had a hatred of the works of the Nicolaitans. We're not sure what was wrong about the Nicolaitans' work. Uh, there's only two mentions of it, and they're both in this book. Um, so we don't really know. But um, we do know that God didn't hate the Nicolaitans. He, God, hated the Nicolaitans' work. And that's a crucial difference which we need to make. But also the Ephesian Christians made that difference. They may have loved the Nicolaitans and helped and prayed for them, but they hated their works because their work, whatever it was, was wrong and not according to God's standards. And that's why they hated the work of the Nicolaitans. And back to verse 3, 3b, they were doing all this, this toil, this patient endurance, this perseverance, this discerning of false doctrine, this hatred of the works of the Nicolaitans. They were doing all this for Jesus' name's sake. Verse 3b. What a church. What an active church. What a keen church. 
but abandoning, abandoning their first love didn't mean that they lacked all these other qualities. So the Ephesians were doing all this, often perhaps for good motives, but they'd still abandoned the love they had at first. This state of affairs is not unique to first century Ephesus. It's possible that such a state of affairs can happen in any church and at any time. And that's why surely we are told, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So that comes right home, does it not? Right home to us here. Right home to any local church. Abandoning the love we had at first doesn't mean that we lack all this hard graft and this perseverance. We can have the one, but sadly abandon the other. Secondly, abandoning the love they had at first does mean does mean that they had forsaken a relationship. The love that the Lord Jesus speaks of in this letter is their love to him. Their, we've just sung that, haven't we, in that last hymn. Their love to him. And that is the most basic love that we're required to give to our God. We know it, don't we? We know it from Deuteronomy, for example. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, you shall love. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. The Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And the Lord Jesus when asked the question, says the very same thing. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Matthew 22, verse 36, 37. Love to God is basic to God's relationship with us and our response to that. It's fundamental. Oh, why does God make that so central and important? Perfect love drives out fear. We mentioned fear this morning, haven't we? Um, a few times. Fear of the unknown, fear of confusion, fear of coronavirus, fear of death, perhaps. Perfect love. If we have this first love in place, love to the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross, that our sins might be forgiven. Love to him will drive out fear. But what had happened to this church in Ephesus? Well, abandoning that first love means that the excitement of that relationship had lost its spark, had lost its drive. The flush of a new adventure that was there at the beginning had diminished. The freedom from a heavy burden of guilt was not felt to be so exhilarating the security of being accepted by the judge of all the earth didn't seem to matter quite so much the assurance that a permanent work had been done was not such a big deal after all 
as it had once seemed. They had forsaken, they had abandoned their first love, the love they had at first for the Lord Jesus Christ. And us? Where is the love we had at first? Is it still as hot? Is it still as vibrant? Still as keen? Is it still as motivating to our lives as it was when we first somehow realised by grace and by mercy that we, even we, guilty as we were, had been forgiven? That the love of God, God, creator, almighty, sustainer of the whole universe, he had had mercy on me. What love! What other response was there for me to give but to love him back? Have we abandoned that love? So abandoning the love they had at first did mean all of these things and more. But it also meant, as we see in verse 5a, a falling away. The language used is of regression. Some regard leaving a faith as progress. They move on. Oh, it was just a phase. I, I've grown up now. I've moved on. I've grown wiser. And for some, leaving man-made faiths is a progression, is a moving on. They've learned to leave behind the false god gods of their childhood or youth or of their keenness in their 20s or 30s. They've seen the folly and the falseness of such a wrong faith. But to abandon solid, demonstrable truth and the secure covenant of love of an utterly faithful Heavenly Father to leave, to forsake, to abandon that love is definitely a backward step. Have we taken it? They had fallen away. But more positively, abandoning the love they had at first also means and the Lord Jesus spells it out, doesn't he? That a reversal is needed. Verse 5a. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. If, if we are in that sad place of having abandoned our first love, if we find love grown cold, as the Lord Jesus said, would happen sometimes. But if we find it in our own hearts, then we are to remember from where we have fallen. We are to cast our minds back. We are to get those dusty diaries, perhaps, that we may have kept when we first came to the Lord and perhaps read them through again. That's what um, Andrew Bonner did. <laughs> That's what I read from that book this morning. He kept a diary of his spiritual progress. If you've got one of those, perhaps you should take it out and reread it to remind yourselves, to remind ourselves of from where we have fallen. And then secondly, and twice in this verse five, repent, remember from where you've fallen, repent of that fall. Ephesian Christians, turn back to where you were. Be utterly 
sorry and repentant for that fall. And the Lord Jesus lovingly repeats that word at the end of verse 5, doesn't he? If not, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. He says it twice. How earnest and urgent he is with his straying people that they should come back to him. And then restore, do the work you did at first. Verse 5 still. Or, verse 5b, your lampstand will be removed. That's big. Some churches die. For some of those that have died, it could be rightly said, the lampstand has been removed. Other churches, sadly, perhaps, are still alive, but they have a reputation of being alive, but really they're dead. These are serious things, aren't they? But we can see how lack of love means certain things. But it also can be accompanied by great zeal, as we saw at first. Thirdly, our last point uh, this morning. A sin pointed out by the head of the church can lead to action. And that same gracious, loving saviour, head of the church, writes this stringent way, this, this harsh letter, well, harsh in, in this little bit that is uh, criti critical of, for a reason. I should say that it's right in the middle of the letter, isn't it? He, he wraps it round with good points. He's so gracious and he's so gentle with us. When we stray, he'll say, yes, you're, you've done well there, but he's so kind to us. But nevertheless, he will speak the truth in love. He's faithful in disciplining his church like this. You see, the point is, the Ephesian church may not have realised that they had moved away from their first love. An abandonment of one's first love, as can be applied, implied from verses 2 and 3, doesn't mean that you necessarily recognise you've left your first love. You're still doing all the stuff that you used to do. You're keen for Sunday school. You clean the church. You preach in a pulpit. And you don't realise your love has declined. How desperately sad is that? Lack of love creeps in so slyly. But the intention of our head is that we will realise it and that realisation will lead to action and change. So they were to listen, verse 7a. We've got ears to hear, let's hear. What were the works they did at first? Well, I can imagine. Can you just have a bit, bit of imagination now? There they were in Ephesus. Ah! Here in that cupboard, isn't there, isn't there a letter that Paul wrote to us? It, we haven't really seen it for ages. Perhaps we'd better dig it out, <sighs> blow off the dust, undo it, unroll it, whatever you do. Yes, there it is, Ephesians. We've still got it. Let's read it. So perhaps that's one of the things they would have done. Dusty cupboard moved out, brought in, read again. They would have appreciated it, Paul's understanding of the mystery of Christ. Chapter 3, Ephesians now, verse 6. The Gentiles are fellow heirs. That was Paul's insight into the mystery of Christ. 
Wow, the dust has blown off. Yes, we used to love this. We used to read it when I was a kid, said one of the Ephesian people. Yes, we haven't read it for years. They would have rejoiced that God's salvation had come to them. But God, verse two, chapter 2, verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. Oh, wasn't it good when we read that letter? Perhaps it was our grandparents who read it. This is two generations later. They've blown the dust off. They're reading these vital, invigorating truths. Their love, perhaps, is being restored. They will have celebrated that they had been given love for people of all races. Uh, Chapter 2, verses 11 following, speaks about the middle wall of partition. And they were Gentiles, you see, in Ephesus. And now they see that it, this was for the Jews, but they have been included. For he himself is our peace, chapter 2, verse 14, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. And that can be true of us, can't it? If you're not a believer and you're watching this this morning, rejoice in this, that you, a sinner, can be brought in to the household of God through the death of the man, Lord Christ Jesus, when he died 2,000 years ago on Calvary, on of who, and of whom Paul wrote in this letter to the Ephesians. So they dusted it off, they blew off the dust, and they, they read it again. They did the works that they did at first. They would have loved one another. Paul tells them to do so here, and I'm sure they did. They would have welcomed strangers into their church. And I can imagine that as they read this, as they read this letter that Paul had wrote two generations before, that their hearts were inflamed again with love for their Lord and Saviour. And this is Jesus' intention in writing the, to the Ephesus church now through John that they should be restored. And if they return to that first love, look what happens. To him who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. That's glorious, isn't it? That's the tree from which Adam and Eve were prevented from eating in the paradise of God. But now, the one who conquers will be granted to eat at the tree of life. And of course, that's mentioned later in the the last chapter of this lovely book, this glorious book, um, where it says about, uh, through the middle of the street of the city, Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its fruits, 12 kinds of fruit. And there it is, the tree of life. That's what will happen to those who are restored. Now, we need to add just a note here before I I close. And that is that amongst and within those upon whom, in whom, God has worked the work of the Holy Spirit of conviction and of new birth amongst those people there cannot be a final falling away God keeps his word and he who began a good work in you if that is true he will complete it And that's a matter of rejoicing. And that in itself should inflame further our love for him. But that brings up the question, of course, of whether you are saved. Have you really come to know the Lord Jesus Christ? Or have you been fooling yourself 
for the last 10, 20, 30 years. Where are you? Is a work of God going on in your heart? Has he reached out? Then he will not abandon you. But if he hasn't, in you hearing this this morning, it's evidence that he wants you now, for the first time perhaps, to turn to him in repentance and faith. What a gracious God we have. This is the gospel. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Have you grown cold? Have you declined in your love for the Lord Jesus? Are you resting falsely upon a profession that now you question, was it real? The message is the same. You haven't yet died of coronavirus. You are still here in this world breathing and thinking and seeing and hearing and that in itself is evidence that the Lord intends for you to turn back to him. What a glorious, gracious, loving God we have. Let's pray together. Father, forgive us if we have abandoned our first love. Forgive us, Lord, if even hearing about it, we have never loved you at all in the first place. Oh, Lord, have mercy upon us, we pray. And see our hearts, and by your Spirit, change us, renew us, cause us to be born again of the Spirit of God, and Lord, if we are indeed your children, oh, restore to us the joy of your salvation and grant us an increased love, like the love we had at first. We ask it all for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.